I've been feeling this whole week is just anger and exhaustion. Hmm. Hmm. That seems reasonable for Venus. It really does. You know, yeah, I, I just... feel like that is a reasonable response to five months of <laughs> difficulty. Like, consistent. It's true. She, she has been in not happy places since, what, right before Christmas? Uh, yeah. I have no idea what my chart, how, how my chart aligns with that. That would have been sixth house for you, I believe, because you're you're uh, so you're the fixed angle. So Leo is your first house, Aquarius would be your seventh house. So yeah, Capricorn would be your sixth. So she spent most of that time in your sixth house, which is daily drudgery and work. Yeah, that's that's the way I'm feeling right right now. <laughs> Just like you know, you know, and and you throw in a little chaos <laughs> from time to time and. You know, I don't know. I really want to go on that cruise. <laughs> <laughs> There's Neptune. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a year away. <laughs> so. Let's see. I'm thinking of, you guys know, if you had the experience of working really hard for, you know, the whole week or a series of weeks. And then as soon as you have rest time, you get sick. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, yeah, I feel like. Mm -hmm for people who are feeling really just completely wrung out um once venus has exited that you know capricorn and aquarius it's the sick time which is also the recovery time you know but it's like can't wait to enjoy this vacation i'm gonna relax and you know things are gonna be chill and people are gonna feed me grapes and you know it's just a giant grapes. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> but then you get cheated out of the enjoyment that you earn from all of the hard work that you put in. It's like, it, oh, it's it's such a, uh, there's that Jupiter Murphy's law. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if like you and I, we, we cycle when something ends, we jump into the next thing and jump into the next thing and jump. We don't, we don't take the moment to really celebrate our accomplishments. And that could be, and, and, you know, this is and, what and I'll I'm say like, <laughs> with someone as a six house Taurus. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> can't go fast. Would like to go fast. Mm -hmm. However, I think for those people who um, ha have the cycle of like, I don't know if you'd call it boom and bust. That's probably not the right term, but like <clears throat> massive work and fallout. Venus in Pisces is so insistent on leisure and rest that mm -hmm. it's kind of helpful. It's like a helpful instruction in the consequences of not setting boundaries, I guess, if that makes sense, um, which is kind of a bitter pill to take sometimes um, because, you know, why should we have to stop? We can just go, 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 especially if we really identify with a workhorse mentality. Mm -hmm. But the um, uncompromising uh, attributes of planets that are in their exaltation, they they can be heavy handed. It doesn't have to be Saturn to be heavy handed. Like Venus is insistent on things being very much Venusian, whether it's overgiving to other people or it's insisting on quality leisure or pay the consequences. I feel like there are lessons here that we can learn um as uh as unpleasant as they might might be sometimes mm -hmm. yeah this is definitely being a diva right now diva for sure i wrote that down in my notes actually ah, diva <laughs> yeah i i know i have to finish these two books i just i lost the motivation this week because i had the launch and it just kind of went well, well, well. <laughs> It it went, um, but nowhere near what I thought. And I'm like, okay, what, you know, what can I learn from this? And, and I'm like, you know, I got to get the other books done. What can I learn from this? I got to get the other books done. You know, it's like, stop. Where could I have done something different? And 
I don't know how the stars play into it. Maybe it was just a bad week for everybody. You know, the first week of April, taxes are coming. So, you know, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> um, but, you know, all of these things rolling in at once. Yeah, it's been like you know, two how, weeks of struggle. Yeah. I mean, how do you pick the most optimal time to release a book? We were Good actually question. talking about that last time. We need to do a whole show on, on electional astrology now because that was an yeah. interesting topic and I am not even qualified to talk about it. Right. And I, I wasn't on that show because I think that was one of my... <laughs> that was the weekend I was at the the Christmas. <laughs> I was like, which one was it? <laughs> yeah, I'm still guinea pig before. myself. I'm yeah. still just trying things out. So there are a number of really talented electional astrologers that can speak to that. Okay, cool. I think we'll we'll definitely have to touch on that topic. But before we get too deep into the weeds, we should probably say hi to everybody. Hello. <laughs> we just kind of jumped on in today. Um, so for those of you out there, thank you for hanging out with us. This is Filling Inc. We are the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing industry. And this is our mid-month astrology check-in where we're going to attempt to read the stars. And we've got Renee back again. Renee, thank you so much for hanging out with us. It's my pleasure. Now, I know since we talked the last time, you were able to get your uh, podcast up and running. And I, I've got to say, I was blown away. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, the I have a YouTube channel, but the idea is you can watch or listen. Um, so it's very visual. I have a chart out and uh, I take it step by step. But also I'm um, speaking the degrees and positions of the planet. So if you don't have a chart in front of you, you can just be listening to it. And um you can find it at just Google Renee Lindsay. I'm just on YouTube, just barely starting out. My first video was in Aries Ingress, and that is very often read um, as like the chart of the world, kind of a year ahead, you know, for the whole world. So I did uh, draw upon a number of astrologers and um, other thinkers, philosophers, anthropologists, and um, critical theorists to really kind of get into what this year what we can expect this year, kind of my long, what is it, a cold take? It's not a hot take. It's, it was about an hour long, really digging in deep. And the one thing I didn't get to do in that first video that I'm starting to do now is get more dynamic with um, a kind of animated image of myself so that I can bring in some humor. And I'm really excited to be able to do that. And um, that will be a, a more, I guess, um, you might miss some jokes if you were just listening. Um, but I'm, I want to be able to balance eventually balance between a, a topic heavy, um, presentation that you can listen to like a podcast and something that's a little bit more like a kind of a, a an astro cartoon. Um, if you want to watch that has more to do with, um, transits. And I do have another video coming up on the 28th for the eclipse on the 30th, but we can talk about that later. I'm sorry, shameless plug, I guess. I'm new no, to this thing. No, that's, that's what you were supposed what we're here to do. for. <laughs> I, I have to ask, how do you do the animation? Because I thought that was adorable. Well, um, so what I do, uh, first of all, I'll just, um, I have my my 10th house, my career house is Virgo. So I'm very organized and very uh, systematic and um, just have uh, I have a step-by-step -step process. I begin with a sketch and, um, that's actually not true. I begin with an idea of an expression. I sketch it out and then, um, I transfer that sketch to illustrator. I trace the sketch. I'm sure there are other ways to do this, but I trace the sketch so I can get a really clean vector and color it. And then that, um, uh, depending on whether or not I'm blinking, for example, that would be two sketches that look exactly the same except for the eye position. Um, I'll make sure to export that as a PNG file, which is clearer than JPEG. And then I'll put that into uh, my video editor after I've storyboarded and everything. It's a, it's a whole assembly line of stuff that I've got going on to make sure that, that all the pieces fit together. But I actually really, really enjoy all of that process. The only thing I think that I really um, struggle with 
uh, effort wise, um, that is to say I get into a flow and I'm totally exhausted afterwards is writing out the script. Um, after outlining, after, you know, gathering my research, sitting down and writing as any authors can tell you, you can really get into a flow, but you've got to recover after because it will pull lots out of you. Mm -hmm. So, so what kind of video editor do you use? I'm just I'm curious. Yeah. I um, it. I did I take a class. One. Let's see. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I interrupted you. Please continue. No, no, that, that was my question. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I took just a really basic digital art class that used Adobe Suite. So okay. I'm just using that for now. Okay. Um, and um, I did experiment with a few, but ultimately I'm gonna go with what I'm more comfortable with. And the mm -hmm. big bonus with Adobe um, Premiere Pro that's in their suite is that they uh, have a caption generator so that I can make sure and close caption my videos. It's super important for me. That's awesome. And uh, awesome. since it's scripted, the transcript is ready, but the captions, that's another beast entirely. So mm -hmm. so yeah. how long from start to finish would you say it takes to make your hour long video? Well, since it's the first one, I will say it pro probably took the longest that any hour long video will take, but I'd say about a month. Okay. Um, the half hour video I've got going, um, I've got anywhere between 15 and 19 or 20 different avatars um, that will, I'm giving myself two weeks. Um, and that is animation plus outline, plus research, plus script, plus recording, plus sound editing, plus video editing. So it is about six days a week. I don't work eight hours a day, six days a week, but I do, I do work that consistently. And um, the big lesson for me um, lately has been to stop when I feel like I'm, my eyes are glazing and not reach for coffee because otherwise I won't be able to continue. And it's very easy when you're starting a venture to burn out at the beginning and that's really not what I want to do. So, so about a month, um, but it was the first one. So I'm expecting the process to streamline. Okay. As, as I go. And if it's a labor of love, it's worth doing. It's, it doesn't right. feel as burdensome as if you're working on something that's not exactly speaking to you, you know, I mean, yeah. you yeah. have to do rather than want to do. I actually yeah. find it pretty much impossible to do things that are, not passion projects, which has been a real problem trying to find um, employment, which is why I'm mm. here doing this thing. Like mm. there's that Taurus, I won't do it. It's like a kid that pulls dead weight, you know? Won't do it. I know the feeling, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good though, you found something that, that you like, that you feel passionate about, that you can work on, that works to, to your strengths. Thank you, oh, absolutely. yes. At long anybody last, making, it's been a journey. Anybody making an avatar, you know, making artwork and making it animated, I'm in awe of because I can only do stick figures. <laughs> so. Thank you. You know, it's funny, actually. I I had never thought as a, this sounds really weird, maybe. It sounds weird just saying it. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, there's such a commodification of art right? Like you can't do art unless it can be fancy or sold or valuable or whatever. But along the same lines, I feel like there's another level to that where it's like, you can't do art unless you're, it's work, unless it's hard, unless you stress yourself out and push yourself. And um, I completely surprised myself into like laughing at some of the expressions that I made and thought, oh, I, I don't actually want to do anything else because this is hilarious. And even if nobody else thinks it's hilarious, I'm laughing and I'm working. And that is totally revolutionary for my work history. So I think there's really something there that's um, certainly I didn't have anybody say to me, make sure you're laughing when you work. Yeah, you know, no. there's this kind of um, this, this mindset that, you need to suffer. This is like, you know, you need you to suffer need and work. Like, and that, you know, serious. that. Yeah. 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 And I don't want to say that working hard needs to only be fun or pleasant. Or that, you know, digging deep doesn't have its own value because it does. I'm talking about this kind of unexpected joy as a way to like balance, balance the, the craft. And I will also say just based on our, um, 
what we know about astrology now as opposed to like 20 years ago there is um in the ancient world i don't know if they told a lot of jokes back then i sort of kind of like i don't i'm sure they did but sure it seems did. very serious and stodgy and so i feel like sometimes astrology can get very um persnickety or even just heavy mm. and the question then is will it's kind of like if you read comedy, does that mean that it matters less than if you read a, a book that's serious? You know, it's a it's a totally different space. Mm -hmm. So um, is it less impactful or important? I think it's different. You know, um, it, it's a different approach to astrology using jokes and poking fun and um, using a bit of a lighter hand that still hopefully the goal is still thoughtful that you come away of going yeah but hmm you know mm -hmm. um and hopefully i mean that's kind of where i'm going and i worry i hope that astrology can go is not super serious and not super shallow but this kind of in between space that has a lot of flexibility it's a lot of food for thought from somebody who's you know never followed it and, or, and never done anything and you know the first time I had a reading was from Katie. So it was like, okay, some things make sense. And and it was nicer, you know, it 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 has both of the, you know, the the drama side, the serious side. And then there's, you know, the fun side of it. Like, okay, you know, we have this. Can we predict what's going to happen next? And as a writer, that's exciting. <laughs> so, yeah, you're already plotting it in your head. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, so so to have humor in, embedded in it is is wonderful too, because humor humor is like my my biggest weapon <laughs> in real life. Maybe not in my books, but in real life, you know, I strive to make people smile and laugh, and, and you know, I'm fun in in my daily meetings because most of the time I can you know, get people chuckling. Um, oh, that's so interesting. And I'm totally different. You know, people say, well, you got to laugh, you got to cry, right? And I'm like, no, but I cry and I bleed, you know? Like, it's just like very serious. Like, why would you laugh? This is so serious. Why isn't your soul rending? You know, like this really yeah. dramatic kind of like existential Phoenix moment. So um, imagine my surprise when I'm cracking jokes in my astrology. It was just, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome though. That's yeah, great. yeah, it's great. <laughs> It's great. I have to turn this off. Little dose of humor goes a long yes. way. I mean, yeah. it can it can definitely make some of those trickier transits. The, the blow is a little softer if you can deliver it with a laugh. Yes, yes. You know, you, you know you're gonna you know be in for you know, a world of. I, I keep Who? finding it interesting <laughs> how typical expectations of a certain transit continue to play out in the opposite way as far as I've seen it. it it's it's like I was saying before the we went live I expected Mars you know Mars and Saturn coming together to be kind of tricky but it wasn't until Venus left Aquarius that it got tricky and Venus is heading into her exaltation she should be happy and things are getting more <laughs> struggle worthy <laughs> it's like why is this not happening the way it's supposed to <laughs> It's a guide. It's not, it's not. I still say Jupiter is Murphy's law. If I expect something, if I say it, I will not get the way I said it. Learn okay. to keep my mouth shut. Well, you bring up a really interesting point about whether there is, um, whether there is a, an absolute meaning behind a planet or a sign. Uh -huh. And, you know, this is not settled. If it were settled, we wouldn't have philosophical arguments. So it's really up in the air. And uh, so I'm going to, you know, poke that hornet's nest a little bit and say, well, it's probably way more subjective than people think. Or, you know, is empiricism actually that much proof, you know, or, or whatever? Like, what is the yardstick with which to measure truth and accuracy when we're trying to predict something? So 
I think it's completely valid to be overwhelmed, exhausted, sick, and all that kind of stuff when a planet goes into it. It's the sign of its exaltation, particularly after it has met with things that seem to be um, quote unquote challenging, which I mean, or we could just say hard, really difficult. We could say, you know, mm-hmm. bad, you know, but not everybody experiences that way. And um, so, so then astrology gets kind of messy or mm-hmm. personally, I think that that's where um, that's where astrology gets interesting is when it's not so easily packaged. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I mean, I guess the price of that interesting is that, there is a certain measure of mm, certainty that gets called into question and that can be really uncomfortable uh, for a while to be like, no, but this is what it means, right? And it forces us into this um, quandary of, you know, free will and fate, which I also think um, is nowhere near settled. But, you know, it's worth, I guess it's worth kind of examining It's worth speaking to these different ways that um, astrology presents itself, you know, on the personal plane and kind of laying them out next to each other and seeing how varied they are, because that also gives a chance to see if there is some kind of tonal undercurrent that, you know, brings them together, right? Instead of getting into like a finger pointing, you're wrong, or this is wrong, or I'm wrong, or, you know, whatever, which... Mm -hmm. It may be like that's what that's what Twitter's for. Sorry, <laughs> but that's how I feel about it. Oh, after Twitter's fun. Yeah. I don't know. It's I have mixed feelings on it, but you know, Twitter is it's one of those things where it's not my scene. Um, so mm-hmm. half the time I'm going, "What is happening here?" Um, anyway, we just got a like that popped up after she said that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, initially when 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 you did my reading, you had you had factored in in what was it in January and the beginning of February, you thought I would have more of a challenge with my creativity, and maybe it was just the psychology in my head because I did not have the challenge then. Hmm. I'm hitting that now. When you said by this time I would be out of it, it's really strange. Yeah, because again, my view was that once Venus was moving into her exaltation mm-hmm. and away from the malefics that she's been basically mm-hmm. fighting against, it should be a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. And yet, <laughs> yeah, it's it's strange. But, yeah, but there's also we we talked about. Um, I think. Brene, it was you who, who said something about lancing a boil when, when Mars yes. and Venus came together and pushed through Aquarius. They're working on some heavy stuff. And mm-hmm. while it's not pleasant, perhaps down the road, the after effects of the issues that are, are springing up right now will mm-hmm. result in something pleasant. That yeah. was when Mars and Venus met Pluto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the stuff mm-hmm. that's buried that comes to the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So... That was a particularly interesting day for me. It was actually should say it was like 48 hours of no. Mm -hmm. Everything no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My car broke down. $400 payment turned into $1,400 Mm -hmm. because multiple things were broken. Things that Mm. I couldn't just go, oh, we'll wait to fix it later because it was like steering column related. You don't want that. You need that. You need that and you need brakes. (laughs) Those are the two things you absolutely need. <laughs> and then I, I was trying to get my kids' doctor's appointments all lined up because the school had called me and said my kids weren't up on their shots. Well, a bill from 2019 resurfaced and they wouldn't see my kids until it was paid. Well, I just shelled out $1,400 for my car. Mm-hmm. And I had to cancel, you know, trips that I was supposed to go on. So it was it was a lot of no. A lot of bad no's. <sighs> yeah. Painful no's. But, um... The lancing the boil part, I would say, is you have your life. The the brakes didn't go out. The steering didn't go out. Right, right. I mean, I don't want to be Pollyanna, but I do feel like um, sometimes there can be um, close calls or bullets dodged that we don't always know about. Mm -hmm. Not Mm -hmm. to um, 
minimize the absolute stress of the situation, though. Mm -hmm. I made it through. I mean, in hindsight, while it's annoying and frustrating, still made it through. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So yeah. far, I'm 100% on my uh, getting through the bad days. Good. <laughs> So um, we have been kind of dancing around what's happening right now. Did you want to go into like current transits in more detail, Katie? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, so last month we left off with Mars and Saturn conjoining in Aquarius being the one that we were watching to yeah. see how that kind of affected everyone. And and for me, that's also a Mars return. Mm -hmm. So I have Mars and Mercury tied together at that same degree that Mars was running into it. So it was like, I think it was 20... 20 degrees and 21 degrees of Aquarius. And I had honestly expected that to be a hard day, but it turned out to be actually a really good work day. I was, I was filled with like, I call it get shit done energy. I was just mm -hmm. powering through things. So I'm wondering how that kind of affected you guys as well. If that was a good or bad, because I like looking at these in retrospect and, and seeing what what was the assumption? What happened? And then color the, the perception going forward. What day was that? And I can basically. Oh, where's my. That name? was April 4th. Yep. Okay. So that so was Monday. Day, yeah. Monday. Monday was a good day here. Tuesday was the, you know, the shit fest. <laughs> Sorry for my language. <laughs> that was the day, you know. Monday, we, we were informed that the roofers would be here Tuesday. So all day pounding on the roof. We had the dog, dog sitting, and the dog got sick. Um, we don't know if it was because we gave him steak juice on his food the night before. <laughs> or, or, or just the stress of being here without his owners or that. So we had that. I had my release party. So I was dealing with that. Um, stuff at work kind of went sideways so i was dealing with that so it was just a day of jumping and putting out fires and doing these things and it was just hugely stressful and by the end of the day i just wanted to crawl into bed and <laughs> forget the day <laughs> well this is a slower transit so it it may peak on a particular day um mm. but it's kind of you know it, it, a couple of weeks before and a couple of weeks after really, mm -hmm. you know, just building up. So um, it's a bit of a misnomer on slower transits to um, bring it to a single day. Um, so that certainly fits in with the theme though. Um, Mars is a hammer um, and the roof as Saturn, you know, those two coming together mm -hmm. to make sure that things are structurally sound, but mm -hmm. um, all that's it, having to go and do and all of My that busyness. Had my husband had to learn a new way to communicate because none of the people who are here spoke English. So I had to figure out how to communicate with them. I just have to point out Aquarius is your seventh house and it's his first house. Okay. <laughs> that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Cause he's like, you know, he went out to tell them something and nobody knew what he was saying and he didn't know what they were saying. And he came back in, he was all flustered. <laughs> And then he figured it out. He used, you know, an app on the phone. Thank you. Thankfully, we have cell phones that do that these days. So um, if my, to use technology for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If my daughter-in-law was here, she speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian and English. So, <laughs> but she was off with my son. <laughs> Actually, she's not my daughter-in-law yet. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it was it was an it was an interesting week. Um, by Wednesday, things had started to calm down. Thursday, they smoothed out, and yesterday, they were fine. It was really like a big boom. <laughs> so, if I'm not mistaken, I think Tuesday was the day Venus made her ingress. Mm, the fifth, yes. Yes, that would be Tuesday, mm. Venus to Pisces. And Pisces is sometimes associated with chaos. You know, just mm -hmm. all kinds of yeah. stuff going everywhere. The yeah. modern ruler of Pisces was is Neptune. Um, just think of you know hurricanes and and deep ocean and all kinds Ooh. of stuff. So, let's see. For me, um, I've had to adjust uh, my transportation. Um, mm -hmm. 
so to do more um, public transport and bicycle. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of reasons, um, but it you know it's having just having to make decisions on what is um, safest for me and what is uh, best for my budget. So that has been a big adjustment of many different things, but especially like time where I put time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that will be a long lasting adjustment. So um, yeah, you had more bikes and time. trains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you and your time properly. Yeah. Right. Lots of rearranging, but also um, I don't know uh, if, I don't know if uh, there are people listening who have been suddenly without a vehicle and having to figure out how to get from A to B or not being able to drive for whatever reason. If you're sitting on transport or you're on a bike, there is a certain measure of um, limbo that can turn into solitude. You know, like you're just waiting, mm -hmm. just waiting for the train. You're waiting for the train to go. You could be reading while you're waiting or whatever, but it's kind of like um, me time, you know, mm -hmm. de facto me time. So there is a, a certain measure of um, having one's attention pull back as well. So this uh, Saturn Mars conjunction also happened uh, on top of my Mars right in between my Mars and Mercury in the third house of short journeys because I will not be taking my bike to the next city mm. too far. So mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. that's how very, that very out. topical. Yeah. yeah. And so it was, was just sorry, I just want to say real quick. I can talk about it now a week later or a few days later, more or less straightforward, but it was um, a bit of a shock. Like, oh my gosh, I have to adjust so much stuff. And it's nice that I can, that I have options and I can choose options, but it was a difficult day um, because of the implications. Mm -hmm. And even if there are really good or necessary changes that need to happen, the implications reverberate with Mars Saturn. Mm -hmm oh, this has to get done, and this means stuff that that reaches out into time, you know? So. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yes. <laughs> We've got, what, another year of Saturn in Aquarius before she finally leaves? Yes, and a retrograde happening in June, June to October, I think. And um, Saturn will go back to its Mars conjunction point. So it's going to go back. And it's possible that these themes get revisited in some way. I think that it will go to 20 degrees, but I need to double check that. So Saturn and Mars conjoined at 22 degrees of Aquarius, and it's going to go forward up to 25 and then station and go back. And I think it's to 20 but i'm not entirely sure i mm, so no i i believe you're right because I, I was looking at that transit all year because that is literally railroading my natal mercury and mars yes same so all year <laughs> just back and forth and back and forth and, and that slow saturn energy in my fourth house tends to affect you know, th that imbalance I have between, you know, figuring out how to be mom and do mom things and have a, a life and do work and get work done and still keep a roof over our head. So there's been a lot of, of the expectation was a lot of stilted negative energy. What I'm finding is it's misappropriation of energy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually I'm, I'm, a really great way to look at Saturn. You know, no to one thing means yes to something else. And, and that's kind of the lesson for this year is I really need to get that balance because I can't continue to exist this way. I will right. eventually burn completely out. So I need to learn that lesson of finding the balance, getting the work done and having a life too. Whether that means, mm -hmm. you know, me time or going out with friends or whatever, I, mm -hmm. I need to not ignore that other part Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, and then you get to do some fun stuff. But you know, whether whether I see you get excited about the the um yes. <laughs> Combat con. 
yes, it's a lot of work, but that's something that I can see the spark in your eyes when you're talking about it. You are really excited about this. So yes, it's work, but that's feeding some of your. Yeah. For Not to take us too off topic because I don't want to miss the, the transits that we want to talk about. Yeah. But the nodes this year for me are in that first and seventh house where it's mm -hmm. the um, the south in the first house, so more of a diminishing energy, less focus on the self. And the north node is in Taurus for me, which is my relationship house. So it's mm -hmm. almost like I'm being pushed into go out, go do things with other people, whether it's work or fun or whatever. And it's been manifesting so far this year in a lot of requests to, to do extra podcasts, mm -hmm. um, being shuffled into you know managing the the, the writer's team for combat con um getting it's random so emails for you know if i can do panels yeah. when i go to conventions so it's 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 i'm being pushed towards you know getting mm -hmm. out a little bit more but i still have that that saturn energy sitting at home going you got to figure out what to do with the energy you can't do it all mm -hmm. right Right. Well, these are uh, Saturn transits. It's a 30 year, you know, 29 year lesson, which I think is really nice. The, one of the things about astrology when we can contemplate is to give it a bit of perspective, you know, so it doesn't necessarily change um, the things that are happening. But um, if I think to myself, okay, the last time Saturn came around to Mars, Mercury, I was 12, you know, so here we go. We're kind of ending, you know, I think to myself, ending a cycle that has been 28, 29 years in the making and starting something new that's going to set the tone for the next almost three decades, which, it, you know, is kind of when it's not overwhelming, it's actually quite exciting because what you're doing now will not have to be revisited in the same way um, for you know, 29 years. I mean, there will be a bit of a check-in because Saturn, you can track to seven year transits, the first Saturn square and a Saturn opposition and so on. But it's not quite the same thing as beginning anew in that kind of initial um, doing things for the first time in a new way. You know, Saturn really is a freight train. It's super hard to move it one way or another, but once it gets going, you know, it's like, well, but if you're going to do something, do it right. Reallocate the energy, take stock, you know, see what you can do, see what you can't. Oh, you think you can do that? Guess what? I'm going to put an anvil on your chest until you <laughs> recognize you cannot do that. You need mm -hmm. to figure out a different way. And, and then when, and that's kind of like, I feel like we can stop there and be like, oh no, I can't do anything. But the other side of Saturn is, you know, investment. So like, well, if you try it a new way, you're going to get this just as much result and maybe it's like way better than you thought you know there's a proportional delivery of, of saturn it will deliver what you can't do in ways that you can't ignore but it will also deliver what you can do in ways that you can't ignore you know both both happens at the same time i'm gonna get off my soapbox my exalted saturn is like hey let me tell everybody no just kidding so um but that said, I, you know, I do think that we tend to be afraid of Saturn a lot because it's, it can be painful. Um, but that's only half the picture. Well, and, and I joke that Saturn is, is like the mommy dearest, but mm -hmm. the, the, the underlying theme with that joke is, you know, yes, it may be harsh and it may not be the way you would hope to be punished when you step out of line, but it's done because it's trying to get you on the right track. So it's done with love. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you hang your clothes on wire hangers, they won't wear as long. So it's a <laughs> mommy dearest joke. I, I really relate to mommy dearest. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So uh, that's my way of joking through the pain of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I got a softer touch with if I say it this way. But the theme is still there. It's you're going to have to do things right or you're going to pay the price. Mm hmm whether that's pay the price of no energy, pay the price of, you know, anxieties, meltdowns, pay the price of losing things. If you're not mm -hmm. doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be corrected. And I think that's kind of why the Saturn return, mm -hmm. some people get hit really hard by the Saturn return. Mm -hmm. Some people seem to skate through it. And I think if you're on the path you're supposed to be on, 
it's not as bad, but it's a mm. course correction if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Mine was very drastic, not horrible, but very, very drastic. I like, think literally- there are, sorry, I, please continue. No, no, go ahead. Well, I'm just thinking, hard to say about a Saturn return. There are lots of factors to keep in mind. Um, I don't know if we could, uh, I don't know if I would be able to reduce it to whether or not we're on the right path or not. But I do think there is something to be said with how resilient we are or or have become um, uh, to that point. And, you know, the nice thing about Saturn is if you maybe have less resilience than um, maybe you want, well, there's your opportunity. Saturn return will help you become very resilient. That's age 29-ish, 28, 29. So, yeah. I, yeah. Saturn. All right. Returns anyway. We could do a whole talk on, on Saturn. Return. That is true. <laughs> it's just a fun topic. It is. But I could do that with pretty much any of these astrology topics. Cause I, I don't, it's like geeking out over stuff. I love just diving in and dissecting everything. Oh, but let's see. So we've talked about Mars and Saturn's conjunction. And we talked about Venus's ingress into Pisces, I did want to ask, just based on house topics, so Pisces for me is fifth house, Pisces for Jane would be eighth house, and that would be fourth house for you? Four, yes. So what are we anticipating thematically with with Venus going into these houses? Uh, well... Uh, Venus at an angle, so we'll say the fourth house, but also it could be the first, seventh, or tenth. It, it's an initiating kind of energy quality. Um, so Venus and Pisces in the fourth, I'm uh, paying particular attention in whether or not I feel a flow in my house. So that could be anything from making sure that my house is tidy and clean um, anywhere to making sure that my office has a good a workflow. I don't know if it's that much about my children, but I have been thinking also about um, magical practices or connection with the occult because the fourth house also has to do with that. And Pisces is a bit, you know, ethereal or non-material, let's say, anyway. Um, so I have definitely felt more of a, an inclination, let's say, to feel connected to non-material things as a as a foundational space, like kind of a baseline, I suppose. Okay. This is a bit abstract. I hope that made sense. No, it, it does, because you're, you're not only working from home, but you live in the home. You have to exist there for a lot of times. So you're, you're the Venus theme of making it that welcoming, flowing, functional space so that you can do everything you need to do within it. That, that would make a lot of sense to me. And inviting relationship with the non-material. That's the Pisces part as, as something that is more, um, more frequent than not. Okay. Jane, what are you, what are you dealing with right now with eighth, eighth house topics? Eighth house is always a weird house. Yeah, I was just looking at that, you know, the, and I'm looking at this, it says, you know, other people's possessions, we can infer from these uh, general fields, there's also rules, legacies, heritages, and wills. And so, anxiety. And, oh, okay, well, we're trying to get a will in place. My mom decided that she was going, last time I was down, that she was going to start giving away her jewelry to get it, yep. Well, you know, I'm the only one that's not freaking out. I know, I, I know someday they're, they are going to pass, but, you know, it's like, okay, if this is what makes you comfortable, sure. You know, and she gave me things and she has stuff for my sister and, you know, <laughs> and I got some, some antique guns from my father. So all of those seem to align with what's happening right now, you know, based on that, you know, it, it, it's all about, well, you know, it says sex and stuff like that and taboo and death, 
Um, I'm hoping that that third one, well, my daughter's dog. Yeah. Death. Um, yeah, let's not talk about sex because <laughs> I'll turn all bright red. <laughs> Suffice um, to say that the eighth house themes are playing out. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And that, and that part of my life is pretty good. So <laughs> everything else is. <laughs> and and ang anxiety, a little bit. When, you know, normally I thrive in a chaotic environment. I was overwhelmed on Tuesday. Mm. And that was unusual for me. <laughs> you know, so. Okay. That's, that's the only, I mean, and looking at that listing, you know, because I Googled it because <laughs> I don't know all the houses as well as you guys. So like, yeah, that kind of makes, makes some sense on that. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, so. we've got an upcoming um, Venus, Jupiter, Neptune conjunction later this month. I am. I'm kind of wondering how that will play out with the themes that we've already experienced with it in the different house placements. Mm -hmm. And Mars that's... will be in sign. Oh, so. that's true. Mars is going in. Um, it, it, it won't be on top of those planets. Venus, Neptune, and Jupiter will be really close. Mars will be about 10 degrees away, a little, a little bit more, 15. So, but we'll still be in Pisces. So it'll be four planets in Pisces um, for fairly slow planets in Pisces. And that's, it, it, you said something about the 30th? Oh, yes, there is an eclipse on the 30th. Okay, yes. because we're opening the campground on the 30th. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Hopefully we are. <laughs> there is a debate about whether or not eclipses are auspicious or that is to say um, fortunate um, or not. And, mm -hmm. you know, it really just depends on who you talk to. And I also think it kind of depends on the eclipse as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say there's there's certainly a kind of a... All eclipses have a chaotic flavor to them. Mm -hmm. But um, this one has potential to be less um, white knuckling, I would say. And more okay. like, oh, wow, that's happening. And this is happening. And this is happening. But it's actually okay you know, or something okay. like that. Now, don't mm -hmm. quote me on that because everybody's experience is going to be different. But mm -hmm. I would like to think that um, an exalted Venus ruling these eclipses will at the very least say, well, I want it this way because this way is nicer and prettier and more relaxing. And then, you know, that might be the challenge or that might be the delight, depending, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. What are you, offer, you're laughing, Katie. I could offer an alternative theory too. Sure. I, I, I noticed how Mars and Venus seem to work together to mitigate pressure, at least for me, in Aquarius. So I, I almost wonder if Diva Venus is walking into Pisces demanding stuff and you got, you know, big boy Jupiter and you got big old Neptune over there going, I don't know. And she's like, you know what? I got my boy back here. Don't make me call him. Like, I wonder if there's going to be like a, a step into that diva moment. I think so. But I don't think that, that Neptune and Jupiter would be like, well, I think they'd be like, if you like, here, let's dial it up to a hundred, <laughs> you know? Oh, you mm -hmm. think you're a diva here? He, he, meet me, biggest planet and, and Neptune, which is like ether. Like, that's just explode the universe with diva energy i feel like it's like maximum maximum diva i don't know that's it's kind okay. of a, too much of an aphorism there's there's not enough contained in that um I've i did write seen... some notes down if you wanted to i i was just saying i've seen my daughter my youngest daughter which everybody's afraid of i love she's, her she's a little miniature little nugget and she scares her. the hell out of people she doesn't scare me, but I, I'm like, <laughs> I am Vicky. <laughs> Does she okay. have Venus Jupiter? I have to look at her chart. I, I, I haven't looked at hers in forever. Um, she is a Leo moon, a mm -hmm. Gemini ascendant, and a Scorpio sixth house sun. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's a force to be reckoned with. And she <laughs> nonstop talker. She is a quick-witted little kid. 
-hmm. and uh, she's tough as nails. Mm -hmm. But the Leo moon shows up a lot. I, I've noticed a lot of the, the Leo moon tendencies of that underlying anxiety and, and needing to, not needing to like show off, but needing to be appreciated. Mm, Something yes. is done. It needs to be recognized because that's part of her self-worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> but just back to that theme of diva, I, I, I can almost see Venus doing this. And again, what I say never happens, so it's probably not going to. But well, there is I, a I chance, though, it. to um, talk about the, uh, the, the drawbacks of a diva Venus, or maybe we could say the drawbacks of an exalted Venus. Um, I, we were talking about this a little bit earlier um, before we began um, recording. There is a Venus in Pisces native that I know who feels um, continuously compelled to give, give, give to others because that Venus is like, I can do it. You know, there's just like this, sure, you know, I can always do it because I'm exalted and I don't, I don't know my limits, you know, and that, that is an entirely different flavor from give to me. It's, it's instead, um, the challenge is when to stop giving. Um, and that's kind of, um, it, it's, it's an unusual territory for exalted planets because there is, uh, I, I read Alice Sparkly Cat, she has a, they have a blog, they wrote a really excellent article about exalted planets as feeling need, needing to strive 100% of the time. And if there's that impetus of never being able to stop and it's giving, then, then there's like no ability to receive. There's no room for that to even happen. Right. And then, then it becomes kind of, you know, torturous, right. This, this forever, forever giving and thinking that it's possible. And then, you know, experiencing the kind of um, shock and um, uh, I would say disappointment, but I think it goes far beyond that, the kind of like despair of, mm -hmm. you know, reaching your limit when really you didn't think that you had any. You know, that's, uh -huh. a, that's the other side of an exalted <clears throat> planet is, no, no, I don't have any limits. And, um, you know, I think that um, anybody who's got a planet that's in, in a sign where they're exalted has to grapple with that in some way or another, whether it's the diva learning to hang back for a minute, or it's the, you know, the Venus that gives and gives at learning to say, you know what, I, I, I don't, I don't have any for you right now. I need for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, when your your whole identity is based on what you can do and you can no longer do it, you have no identity. Right. That's, yeah. That's a, yeah. That's a, a very, very powerful way of showing it. And it it ties very well into the themes that I've been experiencing with Venus in the fifth house, because I've been burning myself out working on a project that is meant to be very helpful. It's meant to be something that should help a lot of people, but it's like killing me to write it right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's material that needs to get out there, but it's not easy and it's trudging up all kinds of painful memories, leaving me feeling angry and resentful and just listless by the end of the day, but it's got to get it's done. Su it's sucking the energy out of you. Yeah. And it's got to get no. done because it, it is going to be a good thing. Yeah, I, I know what the end goal is, but right now just slogging through it is really rough. Yeah. That sounds rough. Yeah. If I was close, I'd hug you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have a happy transit? <laughs> so I think so, actually. Um, cool. A couple. So, uh, okay. A couple of transits. First... Um, we did mention that Mars is going into Pisces um, on April 14th. The thing to remember here is that um, Mars has been in Saturn's territory since for a while. December? <laughs> now I need to go back and think. Oh, yeah, I meant exactly. to look it up and I didn't. Mars went through Capricorn and then Mars went through Aquarius. And that was about four months, I think-ish. Um, and... Um, that's a, a that is a, a structured, ambitious, um, a very 
um, stately sort of energy. Buy the book. Even if it's Aquarius, I'm still going to say that at least Aquarius follows its own rules. Thank you. I was so, going to say, it's not society's book. It's the universe's but book. But it's still yes. the book. So mm -hmm. it's a fixed sign. Um, and in his kind of, um, when, when Mars goes into Pisces, Pisces as Jupiterian water really loves being subversive. Like that's just delicious and wonderful. So now Mars gets slippery and, and has, a, you know, it goes from, from being motivated, motivated by results to being motivated by possibilities. It's a totally different feel. And, and how can, it's not so much like a trickster energy as it is kind of a, um, I would say kind of a, a gotcha, but not even like it's, it's, you wouldn't realize the gotcha until it had already gone. That kind of energy, like, no, wait a second. And, and Mars is long gone going somewhere else. So mm. all of this rule abiding, these morals, these ideals, you know, this structure, the shoulds, it's like, forget it. All bets are off. And there's a lot of flexibility. And I feel like that, along with um, Venus-Neptune conjunction on the 27th, those two in Pisces and Neptune there can really lend itself to very interesting character development in writing. What are the motivations? What are the desires? Here's Neptune going, the sky's the limit. Heck, no, not even that, you know? And, and there's a, a lot of chance to be creative and subversive and really get kind of slippery with what might otherwise be our own kind of structure. Whether that structure is being pantsers and that's the way I always do it, like fine, maybe that doesn't have a, a structure in itself, but if it's the same way you've always done it, then that's its own structure or or whatever. I'm only mentioning that because I've heard, heard you guys say that you are um, pantsers, mm -hmm. I think. You both. Anyway, so yes. <laughs> the point is though, there's this really, really slippery energy that has a way like water to drip through all the cracks that, you know, that we haven't had with Mars for the past few months okay. and it's coming up and I'm, I'm excited for it. The only problem is it isn't very direct. And so if you can kind of roll with funky reasons for doing things or weird ideas, then, then very novel and, and um, creative results can come from that. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm starting to, oops, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I literally have the muse speaks as my note for that, that, that transit. Oh, that's yeah. good. I'm starting to have dreams about my stories. Oh, that's so cool. Which, which I haven't for a while. I'm like, oh, thank God, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I have the, you know, the, the, the beats that I want to do, but this is giving me some more internalized direction. And as you say, it's kind of slippery because it's not really clear, but, you know, it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so it's, it's already starting for me on that. But as I said, I, before we started, I'm sort of like in a tough place this week. It's just started last night, last night, was Friday. Yes. Last night when I actually had a night's sleep. <laughs> without the dog on my bed um that i you know i had a dream about that so i woke up and i was kind of excited so but yeah the news speaks so hopefully that is <laughs> that would be nice yes yes i also have a uh, mercury uranus conjunction Mm. Uh, with notes of intuition meeting quick wit. Mm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that could be another day that mm. might prove good for writing. Good. Yeah, I um, uh, Uranus changes the game. So Mercury Uranus could change the plot. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could just change your mind about something. Um, when Mercury Uranus come in contact, I find that um, me personally, I have trouble sleeping and trouble relaxing however mercury and taurus um you can kind of mitigate that by 
um, body oriented, like moving your body or getting into your body in order to help your mind wind down. Because mm. Mercury and Taurus is going to want to communicate through sensory means um, or, or at least kind of process, take a bath, you'll have an idea, you know, get a nice take sleep, a have an idea. Yep. Mm, yes. Um, take a nice long walk. I can't wait for that. Go shopping. Don't spend too much. Have an idea. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shower thoughts. Those are always the yes. you know, waterproof pad or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Best thing yeah. is in the shower. Yeah, with the little waterproof thing, you know, it would be really nice to write on the tiles and have it. <gasps> the crayons. The yeah. crayons for and the then, kids. You know, wipe it off later. <laughs> okay. There's an idea that kind of went. <laughs> oh, that's perfect, though. I think that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, especially. Um, yeah, just w in whatever way you can be relaxed or even like having a really good meal, have mm -hmm. an idea. Mm -hmm. Or or taking things a little bit slower, have an idea. Yeah. So there's some potential for, for good inspiration in writing, even a, in the midst of the, uh, the Venus drama. I expect it different. And I, I'm actually, I'm not mad. I, I find it interesting how the expectations get twisted and it makes it almost fun each month. So look at the transits and, and plot out what I think is going to happen and then go back and go, well, I was right here. I was wrong here. I was right here. I was wrong here. And then tweak it again for the next one. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a fun exercise. And it, it, it absolutely is for somebody from the outside going, okay, this is what, you know, we forecast. This is where it varied. But did it really vary? Yeah. <laughs> Finding the common thread is really interesting, I think. Yes. yes. And it's yes. nice to be able to talk to somebody who is more experienced yes. to, to clarify, because then, you know, I bounce ideas around, but I, I don't have the baseline yet. I don't have enough educational foundation. So I need somebody I can bounce the ideas off of that knows better to help me figure out maybe what I'm missing. I would push against that idea of knowing better and just simply say knowing different or at the very least having a, an idea that is perhaps a little more fleshed out um, for contrast, right? Because um, we might have, um, we might have disagreements about what something might mean. Um, and my idea um, may have a, a life have sat with it for a longer time or whatever, but this is still really useful in the development of other ideas that come into contact with it, you know, like, oh, I heard, you know, a hundred percent of your reasons for this thing. And I don't agree with it at all. However, hearing that has helped me um, either solidify my position or tweak things here and there. So I think kind of a, um, I don't know that I would call it knowing better. I really push against the, the value judgments because I feel like it's yeah. too, there, our lives are too different. And right. um, yeah, I just, I, I just, I know I have not studied actively as long. So I, mm. I don't have as much muscle memory in this as, you know, you would, hurt, for instance, you've been doing it longer. So I have. I, I, it's true. Longer. Yeah. Well, and I look at it as I, I see the different opinions mm. and I like seeing the different perspectives and the ways that it can be looked at. Because that, again, just like you said, it helps me see something different as well. Mm -hmm. Whether it's not just a right or wrong, it's like a different flavor, a different layer over the top of. And it, it, for me, it's fun. It's, in, it's intriguing. It keeps me active in doing this every month. It keeps me interested in learning more. And, uh, you know, it becomes a nice hobby that I can break away from, too. You know, because it's a lot of heavy thought processing, writing, perfecting things. I need something fluffy that I can kind of... I can go and enjoy astrology is not fluffy, but still. I mean, it is and it isn't. It depends on who you talk to and where. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. I try and, and find the fun in it, though. Yes. I, yes, I do think it's fun. And I think um, there's something about being able to poke fun at something that allows us to see it in ways that find truth that might otherwise be too scary mm. you know comedy mm. circumvents some things that that we have judgments around and, and perhaps for good reason you know not all comedy is great 
Um, but the idea of comedy is that you can, you are allowed to point to the thing that we don't want to talk about and make a joke about it, which it gives access, right? So making astrology fluffy or at the very least a way to relax oneself, I think is super awesome. And it, you know, you don't always hear, and I'm not just saying that that's the only reason that you engage astrology, but that being a total benefit, um, seems less popular these days. It could be that um, I'm not exposed to as many um, varied opinions as I would like to be, though. I just want to qualify that real quick. Well, if you're on Astro Twitter. <laughs> or even just reading ancient texts, which seem to have like no sense of humor at all. So, and that's, I'm, it, it's probably an anachronistic read, you know, I don't understand the context of the time, mm -hmm. but I still get, you know, my eyes are rolling like, okay, Valens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I wonder if you could go back in time, how, how they would have actually spoke and what their sarcasm would have been like, because you know, they had to have been sarcastic. Yeah. Yes, there will, you know, if you know how to read the language, there's a lot of, what's the term? Shit posting? Is that the right term? <laughs> yes. There's a lot of mudslinging. There's a lot of mudslinging in like Aristotle really hated Pythagoras. Like he just, all in all, like he just couldn't, st like, and other, and Heraclitus also really. <laughs> Heraclitus was just like, and other people like Pythagoras are just stupid, you know, and this is in my philosophy text, you know, the translations of the fragments of the pre-Socratic. Anyway, so, you know, I, it's there, but I kind of wish it were easier to access and didn't have to be mm. mined. Maybe that's part of the pleasure of finding it is that you do all this, you know, very serious work and then you come across somebody just, you know, slinging mud. Yes, <laughs> that's it. right. No matter where yeah. you go, there, there's somebody, there's some form of Twitter out there <laughs> where yes. people are just mad dogging everybody. <laughs> and again, I approach, if, if you see my Twitter profile, it, it literally says, this is where I go to blow off steam. This is, this is not the professional version of me because I go to Twitter mm. to blow off steam. I have fun liking things. I make random comments. I go there as a fun exercise. I don't go there very often. <laughs> I don't treat it as anything serious. And uh, I can enjoy it, again, from that level. If mm -hmm. I approach it with that, I'm going to go have fun and I'm going to go like and share and say stupid things. Okay. Yeah. I can enjoy it better. <laughs> True. I have not been that successful. I'm like, this can be short and meaningful. No. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I come across one in a million and I'm like, oh, look, it's possible. Uh, but then, you know, uh, for some reason, I'm not able to live up to my standard and I lose my temper <laughs> sometime and go, I mm -hmm. right. so you think your way into a beautiful post. Nobody will see it. Yeah. You can post a stupid meme and everyone loves it. Mm -hmm. Going with memes. Yep. <laughs> I gave up a long time ago trying to be poignant. Just, you know what? We're going to do memes now. Yeah. Because they, I, again, I, it's, a, it's an outlet. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the way mm -hmm. I approach it because that's the way I can deal with it. And definitely it has its own place, you know, yeah. for sure. Like we, it, just because I don't do Twitter well, doesn't mean I think mm -hmm. that Twitter um, shouldn't exist the way it does or whatever. It's just, um, I'm just not very built for that space. Yes. It's not for everybody. But then again, social media is really not good for us. Right. It's really, I mean, as much as it brings us together, it, it causes, I think, a lot more problems than it solves. There and is a lot of research on that um, I, with kind of like varying outcomes, m more leaning towards a sense of alienation um, through like you're connected, but not really. Right. On the other hand, there are uh, certain um, benefits to being able to connect in a virtual space as well. It's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's a baby in bathwater situation. I don't think we're responsible enough for that, though. But we like humans or we like yeah. this group? Yeah, humans <laughs> in general. We are not responsible enough to handle the, the social aspect in the positive way. Because 90% of what it's used for is, like you it's said, shit posting. Thing. 
striping and, and chip posting have, and all of this, this knowledge and, at our fingertips and the ability to contact somebody on the other side of the world. And what do we do? We call each other out. We troll each other and we post cat memes. I mean, cat yeah. memes sort of redeems the whole project as far as I'm concerned. There is nothing wrong with cat memes, <laughs> but I mean, that's pretty much what we use it for. <laughs> hmm. I'm not 100% on board, although I see where you're coming from. I have okay. faith in humanity to my detriment, but I do. No, I, you know, yeah. Such an Aquarius. So on that bright note, <laughs> I like that, that we end on such a nice, you know, I have faith in humanity. <laughs> I do too. I'm more of a, you know, glass half full than glass half empty person as well. We're all doomed that. again though my <laughs> week has been colored by trauma 100 yes. percent trauma so yes. Yes. <laughs> i'm not able to yes. see the glass right now <laughs> right right <laughs> you're seeing the fires outside the window not the glass <laughs> the glass got knocked over a while ago <laughs> <laughs> but this has been good I, I've, yeah. I've enjoyed um going over the transits with you renee i love having you on here you bring a very good perspective, so I hope we can bring you back again. And oh, I thanks. will yeah, I'd love that. make sure that your um, link is posted in our show notes about 10 minutes after I finish this and I can download it. Um, we'll make sure that it's all up. We'll uh, do the audio podcast and I'll send you that link. And hopefully we can join up again in the coming months and uh, check and see where we're at. See how mean or nice Venus has been to us. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for having me on. Definitely. Thanks Thank for you for coming. <laughs> now, next week, guys, for those of you who are still watching, uh, Jane, I know you're off. Yes. But Derek reached out to me with his audio narrator about the, uh, yeah. Dino Rift? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, can can I come bring my audio narrator on to talk about this? And I'm like, uh, yeah. So we're going to be doing that one next week. So I will be back. Jane, I know you're going to be out. But after that, I believe we've got some more uh, fun, fun stuff planned. Yes, yes. I, I, I would say if I can try, if we're home, um, I will, I will pipe in. Eric is <laughs> but, always fun. But I'm not, I'm not going to guarantee it because you know we're at my daughter's house and get, you know it's not fondue. <laughs> but... Totally, totally understandable. Totally understandable. But yes, yes. All right. Well, thank you guys again, and. Uh, We'll be back next week. Everybody take care of yourselves.